Hi, I'm Richard Niles. Over the years, I've had so many messages about these radio shows I did for the BBC back in 2005. Some of the greatest musicians, people like Pat Metheny, Randy Brecker, and Michael McDonald, not only explaining their process, but I got them to demonstrate their concepts on their instruments. I'm really glad to be able to bring you these shows, and if you enjoy them, check out my books shown here. Okay, enough of this shameless plug. Let's start the show with my theme song for Inside Improvisation. Yes, I can't help it. I am Richard Niles, and I'm going to take you on a worldwide jam through blues, country, and pop music on this third traveling installment of Inside Improvisation. Cuban sax and clarinet master Paquito de Rivera playing One for Tom, a groovy composition of his dedicated to the great Brazilian composer Antonio Carlos Jobim, also known as Tom. Jobim created the bossa nova in the 1960s by blending American jazz with Brazilian rhythms. Hey, that's the USA, Cuba, and Brazil already, and we haven't even broken a sweat. Paquito whipped out his clarinet and told me that improvisation is not limited to one country or style. I think the greatest invention of the 20th century is this little thing that we call jazz. Jazz is the music of a country. Main characteristic is the immigration, the multinationality. The contribution of Latin American people into the mainstream jazz have been monumental, mainly from Cuba and from Brazil. Also, they have been influenced by the music of Argentina and the tango. That music has been caricaturized for the longest time. It's what I call the Carmen Miranda syndrome. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you say you are from. If you are from, from south of the border, they will sing to you La Cucaracha, which is a German song, I believe. So <laughs> Musicians in general are paying more and more attention to our roots, you know, trying to understand this. It's totally different in Mexican than in Argentinian. So the elements of the music of Cuba have been present in jazz since the very beginning. People like Juan Tisol from Puerto Rico, trombonist with the Ellington Orchestra, Perdido, Caravan. Later on, Mario Bauza, who came here in 1928, did a great contribution to the consolidation of what we call bebop today. It was called Cuba because of the inclusion of people like Chico Farrell and especially Chano Pozo. In Manteca is where you can hear the marriage between Afro-Cuban music and jazz. It's a very Afro-Cuban type of pattern, and this he played on top of that, his bebop thing. That was one of the first times that the marriage of Cuban music with bebop took place. For example, Cuando Vuelva Tu Lado, which is a bolero written by a Mexican composer. The name in English is What a Difference a Day Made. Etc., etc. So, the jazz element comes when you do the improvisation or the embellishment or the melody in bebop terms. Then the blues element. (laughs) 
So in America, all those elements, they converge. So it's perfectly compatible if you know what you are doing. If not, the Carmen Miranda syndrome, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> pa -pa 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 the first time I went to Brazil, I was expecting every woman to have pineapples and bananas in their head. <laughs> For example, jazz music have a unique element, the sense of swing. It's almost impossible to explain what is that. But for us, swing doesn't have that swing. Our A notes are even. Taka, 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 no, no, tang, kakang, no. Guitarist Pat Metheny explained why jazz came so naturally to the Brazilians and why Brazilian music comes so naturally to him. As much as I have been, and many other jazz musicians have been affected and interested in Brazilian music, I think it's also very important to note how much jazz has influenced the Brazilian music that we all love. And for that reason, I don't see Brazilian music and jazz as being unrelated. The musicians from Brazil that have really impacted me are Antonio Carlos Jobim, Milton Nascimento, and Yvonne Linz. At the same time I was learning standards and Charlie Parker tunes and Wayne Shorter tunes and everything else that I was learning, I was also learning all those 25 Jobim tunes that we all know that are the bedrock of modern Brazilian music. The first chord every American learns is this. The first chord every Brazilian learns is this. <laughs> and that sort of says it all. That part of the jazz language was something that never really impacted the natural Brazilian music that much, which was the linear kind of single note, soloing kind of thing. Well, I was lucky enough to spend a swinging and grooving hour with the Brazilian pianist and singer Eliani Elias, who was a member of Steps Ahead with Michael Brecker in the 1980s and has released many superb solo albums. We were joined by one of the most musical double bass players on the planet, Mark Johnson, who made his name in the 70s with the great Bill Evans. I started by asking them to explain the difference between Latin and jazz rhythms. The jazz tunes, when people listen to them, Normally they would clap at two and four, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Brazilian music, you listen and you would clap on two, but it's a slow two, it would be one, two, one, two. So if it was Brazilian, but Right. Say if we do desafinado as a jazz, right? One, two, one, two, three, four. Okay? Now we do it as a Brazilian. One, two, uh, one, two, three, four. to play in, in the Brazilian context the basic two feel. Anticipate the downbeat just ever so slightly so it feels it propels the beat a little bit. piano 
about the Brazilian is that I really try to create the rhythm. Like, if I would play this rhythm outside of the piano, it's like a samba school. That's what I'm doing. Like, I'm really playing the entire rhythm. Whether you use the word swing or groove or the bomb, baby, improvisers do it their own way. Yeah. Imagine with me for one minute that the world was flipped on its head. Everything was turned upside down and jazz ruled the planet. Yeah, jazz ruled planet Earth. Yeah. <laughs> Winner of the BBC Jazz Awards Soweto Kinch includes hip-hop and freestyle rappers in his music because it's as natural a part of his life as bebop saxophone. Right after the inaugural 20-minute burnout solo by Kofi and <laughs> by virtue of the influences that have been around me growing up listening to hip-hop, rapping at the same time, and steeped in and developing an increasingly strong love for jazz music. I feel like even increasingly it's a duty to blend those two interests in a cohesive way, and one that doesn't compromise the other. It's not just a case of me playing over backbeat or turning my cap backwards. It's about developing a common language that a hip-hop audience could appreciate and that jazz musicians in the tradition would certainly get with. What if jazz had queens and kings? Right now, I'm actually just trying to represent all the disparate <laughs> elements in my musical mind. There's a whole list of people, and people who were so witty and so well-equipped to freestyle and improvise in a hip-hop context as well. Once there are almost a store pile of punchlines and phrases and words, it again provides a decent platform for you to do something more pure with. What if jazz musicians were mainstream? Always on the cover of celeb magazines. Most basic introductory level, the cat sat on the mat and, you know, you, you literally are just looking for words that rhyme and match. But then at its highest level, and I guess it's just like any muscle you have to exercise and, and practice regularly, then you're able to tell a story, you're able to weave a narrative, you're able to fit whatever words and sentences come to mind into a consistent rhyme pattern. And that's only possible, you know, through just doing it all the time, every day. Office culture will be in slow mo with regular breaks to listen to bass solos. Well, one of the most muscular styles of music is the blues, without which you'd wipe out most of pop, soul, R&B, gospel, and jazz. American guitarist Stephen Pettit can be seen performing on the London Underground and is a great lover of the blues masters. I asked Stephen to give us a brief history of the blues. What we uh, now know as the blues originated in the southern states of America. The slaves who had been brought over from Africa brought along with them certain chants and basic rudimentary folk songs based around a pentatonic five-note scale as a way of communicating whilst at work in the fields and also during their time when they were entertaining each other. These chants and folk songs evolved into what we now know as the blues. Originally, blues was a, an acoustic music, and in the South, the primary originators that emerged were people like Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, Tampa Red, Sun House, Lead Belly. I got grasshoppers in my pillow, mama. I got crickets all in my meal. I got grasshoppers in my field of mammal. I got crickets all in my meal. The growing mechanization of agriculture, coupled with uh, World War II's demand for ever increasing amounts of manpower in the factories of the North, resulted in a huge migration of the farm workers to the industrial cities of the North, and uh, they brought along their customs and their music. And because electricity was far more widespread in the North, their music changed from something that had been uh, acoustic only and sort of a country folk idiom to this new electric music, which became known as City Blues. B.B. King 
His style was uh, known to be a more sophisticated, more urbane. He pioneered the finger vibrato. His style of playing was known as the talking style, whereby he made the guitar talk, uh, as in a conversation. King was more limited, known primarily for a repeated musical pattern, which we musicians call a riff. He was also known for his arching bends and the amount of notes which he would collect along the way between a uh, two-step bend, which involves four notes in terms of the quarter notes and all the notes in between, which are used often in such forms of music as Indian and Oriental music. Eric Clapton was a keen student and had great respect for all these blues players that I've mentioned. In the 60s, he took the blues guitar to a new level. His work with the Yardbirds initially and then John Mayall and Cream was groundbreaking and hugely innovative. also has a lot of great improvising fiddle players, git pickers, and pedal steel guitarists. <laughs> That's Allison Krauss playing there in the background. Now there's a million great players in Nashville, but if you're working in the London studios and you need a country violin solo, you call Yes Siree Bob Love Day. There's all these different styles. I remember starting off doing quite a lot of Cajun music where the fiddle is actually, unusually, one of the rhythm instruments. Let's say we just played the same chord progression we just played, but more in a bluegrass style. Can you give them an example of that? show how sliding and bending is done on the violin? And I also noticed you're using a lot of like two note voicings where you get one note moving underneath the, the sustained note. Oh, yeah. yeah, just taking advantage of any rooty open strings that happened to be around at the time. Can you give an example of that really fast rhythmical style? I guess it would be a bluegrass thing.
pop music and TV commercials use improvisation all the time. Not only is much of it based on the blues, but the tradition of the instrumental solo was one of the many things pop kept from the days of the big bands. Guitars and saxophones usually get the gig, but the difference is solos in pop and TV jingles are usually very short. The player has to know how to hit the listener right in the solar plexus with only about eight bars to do it. One of the guys who knows how to take a short solo very well is the guy on this theme to the popular U.S. Regis Philbin morning show, British saxman Chris Hunter, who, before he became one of New York's hippest jazz cats, played on hits in the 1980s for Incognito, Kajagoogoo, Lynx, ABC, and Joe Jackson. Hey Chris, what do you do if you're on a session and the producer says, Chris, give me the garlic right in the face. Well, okay. Yeah, see? There you go. You started out with something provocative. You then went into something bluesy to get get their attention. And, and then, then you end, one of those nice some- squealy kind of climactic... Yeah, then you end it with something squealy and like... You know, there's, there's actually, there's a TV show that, that runs every day. That was one of those situations where trying to be as extreme as possible, but also taking into account what the situation required. So if a producer says to you, and it's very unlikely that you would, but if he said to you, give me a bebop solo, something right in the style, right now, what would you do? I can give you an example of what bebop playing is. So that's instant bebop. What if the producer says, lay down some R&B, baby? You just play something that was... Improvisation is not just about taking flashy solos. Rhythm section players are often improvising their accompaniments to songs, and no one accompanies himself better than Michael McDonald. This legend of popular music began his career in the studios of L.A., and before the Doobie Brothers and worldwide acclaim as a singer-songwriter, he played on sessions for other artists like Steely Dan. I did, oddly enough, play on sessions when I first came to California, but it was like the great imposter. You know, I'd get these sessions and... Only hope that no one got wise to me before the end of the session. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might have thought you were an imposter, but if they kept calling you again, maybe you were wrong. Well, yeah, I, but I think one of the important things I learned listening to old R&B records, specifically Ray Charles, I think to me one of the most genius bits of improvisation was on Ray Charles Busted, where the opening thing, there's this big horn chart going on, and he's got this little one bar space to play something in, you know, it's like And you know, he could have done a million things, he could have just uh, played all over the place, but he just chose to do it. Which is just, you know, to me, pure genius, you know. We've recorded older songs over the years that, just by virtue of being older songs, they kind of called for a little bit of improvisation to bring something new to the record. And we recorded a track with Ray Charles, Hey Girl. Uh, Hey girl, I want you to know I'm gonna miss you so much if you go
This is so lonely This is goodbye Oh And we kind of improvised on the second verse with these changes Hey girl can be true How am I Supposed to exist without you Hey girl Sit yourself down I'm not Ashamed to get down on the ground But it's just in that one little movement that... Sure. A lot of your trademark keyboard work uses a lot of moving triads and cool bass movement, which is really a gospel thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was introduced to gospel music growing up in St. Louis. Some of the guys I played with and, you know, had grown up in church playing. And, for instance, like with Taking to the Streets, that was very much in a gospel structure. With... kind of over the years taken that to a uh, embellished on that whole you know uh, that was the, basically the the lick there and the, the song kind of travels over the you know anymore now it's kind of more like a Just a one in five, you know. And another thing in gospel music, uh, minor over major. Fantastic, man. Yeah, great. Trumpet player, composer, and ace session man Randy Brecker has played on his share of pop records, too. Improvisation is a large part of pop music. In pop music and funk and rap, the basic pulse is more dugga 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 So I play something like I could slide into a funk groove. all based on a scale D minor and a funk beat so there's a myriad of different ways you can go when you improvise and if you're a serious musician you're able to navigate all these waters depending on what the situation is Randy Brecker there grooving us mercilessly and though there's a big hook around my neck pulling me off my chair I'll be grooving you next week how do composers inspire improvisers to new heights of performance? And what's in the future? Where in blazes might improvisation be headed next? Well, I'm headed home, but I'd like to thank all the great artists who took part, and my producer for Unique, Anna Harrison, for putting down the hook long enough for me to tell you that I'll still be Richard Niles on BBC Radio 2 next Tuesday night when we'll bungee jump inside improvisation!